radio contact in San Francisco. Air traffic control telling the cockpit six times do not land, fearing there was a passenger plane on that runway. The standoff right now, the fugitive officer who cut off his GPS tracker. The boulders thrown from an overpass, the windshield smashed, the father killed. Tonight, authorities say the teenagers behind the deadly prank. And remembering a well-known actor who made so many laugh. This is ABC World News Tonight with David Muir. Good evening, and it's great to have you with us here on a Tuesday night. And we begin tonight with two leading Republican senators taking on President Trump. One of them standing on the floor of the Senate late today and saying, I rise to say enough. Arizona's Jeff Flake adding, I will not be complicit. It comes just hours after Republican Senator Bob Corker reignited his very public feud with the president. Corker calling the president, quote, an utterly untruthful president. President Trump unleashing a Twitter attack. And tonight, the White House responding. ABC's Mary Bruce leading us off. Standing on the Senate floor, the Republican senator delivered an extraordinary indictment of the Republican president, calling Donald Trump reckless, outrageous, and undignified. I rise today to say enough. Arizona Senator Jeff Flake says he will not run for re-election because he is so disgusted. The personal attacks, the threats against principles, freedoms and institution, the flagrant disregard for truth and decency, the reckless provocations, most often for the pettiest and most personal reasons. And to his colleagues, a warning that, quote, silence can equal complicity. We have fooled ourselves for long enough that a pivot to governing is right around the corner. A return to civility, civility and stability right behind it. We know better than that. Calling it a matter of duty and conscience, Flake now joins a wave of top Republicans ripping into the president. This morning, it was Senator Bob Corker letting loose on GMA. I would just like for him to leave it to the professionals for a while. In response, the president unloaded in a barrage of tweets, claiming he refused to endorse Corker, saying he couldn't get elected dog catcher, and calling the influential head of the Foreign Relations Committee a lightweight, incompetent, adding people like little Bob Corker have set the U.S. way back. Corker, who has called the Trump White House an adult daycare center, tweeting back, same untruths from an utterly untruthful president. Hashtag alert the daycare staff. He told reporters everyone sees through Trump's bullying. And I think that the worst of it is going to be just the poll debasing, if you will, of our nation. You think uh, the president's debasing the nation? Uh, I don't think there's any question. Corker was an early supporter of Trump, but asked if he would do it again. He said, no way. It all comes the same day the president traveled to the Capitol to rally Republicans on tax reform. Mr. President, any comment on Senator But his feuds are overshadowing his agenda. Does any of this make the president pause and wonder if he is doing anything wrong, that he bears any responsibility? Look, I think the voters of these individual senator states are speaking uh, in pretty loud volumes. I think that they were not likely to be reelected. And I think that shows that the support is more behind this president than it is those two individuals. So let's get to Mary Bruce live on the Hill tonight for us. And Mary, the White House says Senators Corker and Flake are from states that voted for President Trump. But even though they're not running for re-election, they're still around for a while. And the president needs their votes, especially with his big push for tax reform. Exactly. And David, a reminder of the math here. Senate Republicans have just a two vote majority. And now you have two top Republicans who don't feel the pressure of reelection and aren't exactly inclined to just fall in line behind the president. But some Republicans are happy to see them go. A source close to Steve Bannon told ABC News his reaction tonight. Another day, another scalp. David. Mary Bruce leading us off tonight. Mary, thank you. And next tonight here to new video obtained by ABC News and new reporting tonight. Who ambushed and killed those four special ops soldiers? We now know the mission changed for those four soldiers and their team, morphing into a second mission for a high-value ISIS target. And tonight, was it more than the Pentagon? Was the CIA involved? Here's our chief investigative correspondent, Brian Ross. U.S. intelligence authorities tonight are examining this video of a militant group active in the area of the Niger ambush. Young men with motorbikes and heavy weapons. Allah Akbar! shouting Allah Akbar, God is great. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Looking to see if the two dozen or so men were directly involved in the deadly ambush that killed the four U.S. soldiers. 20 of the attackers were killed, the rest escaped on motorbikes. Allah Akbar. 
The video was provided to ABC News by a former U.S. military expert on West Africa. The images reportedly sent around the time of the attack to residents of the village where it happened. The men speaking in local ethnic dialect. It says if we capture them, what are we going to do with them? One of them says we'll decapitate them. Another guy says we'll fight them with weapons. Rudolf Atala spent years in the region for the U.S. military and says the video was actually shot by the leader of the local militant group who was named Abu Wali, who last year pledged allegiance in another video to ISIS. He is certainly one of the, I would say, high-value individuals that, uh, that uh, the, the U.S. government is looking at. U.S. forces have been in Niger for four years now, training local troops and waging a secret war against terrorists that also involves the CIA. So are they taking risks? They are. Two senior U.S. intelligence officials tell ABC News tonight that the mission went from reconnaissance to kill or capture after the unit received information that a high-value target had been located some eight hours away. They were ordered to move on his location but found nothing. Did the mission change? That is one of the questions that's being asked. It's a fair question. The ambush took place as the unit returned to base, low on sleep. Their movements now being tracked by the militants. Help did not arrive for two hours. And Brian Ross back with us tonight. And we know the Pentagon has said that when the original mission was planned, contact with the enemy was, quote, unlikely. We are now hearing that this mission changed to a kill or capture mission. So the right. question, were these American soldiers adequately prepared for that change in mission? Well, David, that's the key question. Investigators have been told there was a second Green Beret team that was supposed to chopper in to meet up with the first team, but that they never made it. Now the question tonight, David, is why? Brian Ross tonight and your team, thank you. Now to the dangerous weather on both coasts tonight. A dangerous commute here in the east. Thunderstorms, wind and rain. A regional airport in Hickory, North Carolina. Take a look. Ripped apart by severe winds. And this home in Shelby, North Carolina, pushed right off its foundation. Reports of several tornadoes. And here's ABC's Lindsay Janice. Tonight, high winds toppling trees, sending them crashing onto cars and power lines across the northeast. It's the same system that rocked the southeast overnight. In the Carolinas, multiple EF2 tornadoes now confirmed. In Spartanburg, South Carolina, Jesse Sparveri huddling in the backseat of his car as the storm moved through. My car was shaking uncontrollably. At one point, I thought my car was actually in the air. I had no idea where I was. His windows shattered a wooden projectile landing in the driver's seat. Trees snapped, a tractor trailer overturned nearby. Our Gio Benitez is in North Carolina. Here at Hickory Regional Airport, we're seeing some unbelievable damage. Take a look, a hangar just destroyed, planes tossed around like toys. A half foot of torrential rain causing flash flooding in Boone. This vehicle floating away. Wes Berry caught in his minivan. Wave of water washed over the hood and uh, stalled out. In the West, critical fire conditions in parts of Southern California. The region now a tinderbox. More than 4,000 firefighters battling blazes across the state. And David, these storms have made a mess at airports. More than 750 flights canceled, nearly 300 of them here at Newark Airport. David. Lindsay Janice, our thanks to you. Let's get right to Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z tonight. And Ginger, you're tracking these storms and the record heat and the fires in the West tonight. Absolutely, David, both. And let's start on the east where we've seen the front just passing now here in New York City, but to our north and east near Boston, already hearing of numerous trees down thanks to huge wind gusts back toward that low pressure system attached to the cold front. Lake Superior, giant waves, Lake Michigan too, and gusts up to 60. Now I want to take you through the timing. It's over by noon tomorrow out of New England. Then the headline 103, a record high in downtown Los Angeles. Red flag warnings, those heat advisories, including Santa Barbara, go through tomorrow for many because the heat will still be on for game two. But tonight, David, will be the hottest World Series game on record in L.A. All right, Ginger Z with us tonight. Ginger, thanks as always. We turn next here to the killer on the loose in a Florida neighborhood. Three murders in 10 days as we've been reporting and now the urgent hunt for this person. They want to talk to this man tonight. The simplest tasks from going to the grocery store to walking the dog have now become a real concern. ABC's Victor Akendo from Tampa. Tonight, a tearful plea from the father of Monica Hoffa, one of the victims gunned down in Tampa. I need that community to stand up and I need them to point out, you know, who that man is. He's the person of interest Tampa police are desperate to find spotted near the site of the first of three shootings. Three victims killed in less than two weeks. Police say the crimes are connected. 
parents today escorting their children from school. I used to walk, but with all this commotion going on, I've been driving. All the shootings within a half mile. Benjamin Mitchell shot and killed around 9 p.m. while waiting at a bus stop. Four days later, Monica Hoffa's body was found in an empty lot. She'd been walking to a friend's home. Six days after that, 20-year-old Anthony Naiboa killed on the street around 8 p.m. after hopping on the wrong bus after work. Today, just a block from there, we met Ron and Sarah after a grocery trip they will no longer make at night. 7 o'clock, we're in the house now. I mean, yeah. you're not going outside past dark? No. Inside, their guns out of the safe and ready. They won't even walk the dog without carrying a weapon. Now's the time. Wait. Got to protect my family. A community living in fear, prepared for the worst. The mayor and the chief of police promising not to stop until the killer is caught. David? Victor Akendo, thank you. And next to the air scare at the San Francisco airport, an Air Canada flight failing to respond to six separate calls from the tower to abort their landing. Authorities fearing there was already a passenger plane on that runway. Here's ABC senior transportation correspondent David Curley tonight. The message was clear. Air Canada 781, go around. A jet cleared to land in San Francisco Sunday. Air Canada 781, go around. Told six times in just more than 35 seconds to abort its landing. Air Canada 781, go around. The problem? Controllers worried that an aircraft already on the ground might not get off the runway in time. Controllers tried the radio three more times, even using a flashing red light gun to no avail. The A320 landed safely, finally contacting the tower. That's uh, pretty evident. This after the July incident at the same airport, same airline. A jet lined up to land on a taxiway occupied by four other jets. A disaster avoided as the Air Canada pulled up just feet from one of the aircraft. Anytime you have two instances of something that are very similar, it's a red flag. Is there a problem with procedures? Is there a problem with training of crews flying into this particular airport? Air Canada says the pilots were cleared to land and it will look into why they didn't receive the instructions from the tower. But that airline is now subject of two FAA investigations. David? David Curley, thank you. And next, more than a month now after Puerto Rico was struck by that devastating hurricane, three quarters of the island are still without power. Tonight, your money at stake $300 million in FEMA disaster funds. And the Montana company, given the contract to get the power back on, with just two workers when it landed that contract. One lawmaker tonight saying this does not smell past the smell test. And here's ABC senior justice correspondent Pierre Thomas. More than a month after Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, 75% of the island is still in the dark. And tonight, new questions about the company that landed a key contract hired to restore power. Whitefish Energy, a private Montana company with just two full-time employees, awarded a $300 million contract by the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority. We're doing what we can with what we have, and we plan to be here until everyone has power. The company showcasing its work on Twitter, saying its newly hired team of 300 now working to rebuild those towers in Puerto Rico. But tonight, some Democrats are already calling for an investigation into that contract. Whitefish Energy is from Whitefish, Montana, population just over 7,000, hometown of Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke. Look, I've been at this for 25 years, and this does not pass the smell test. Zinke's office telling ABC News he knows the owner because they both live in a small town, adding that the secretary's son worked a summer job at one of their construction sites. But today his office was emphatic. Neither the secretary nor anyone in his office have taken any meetings or action on behalf of this company. Whitefish says they're simply the best team for the job, pointing out they use helicopters and repair buckets that reach 70 feet higher than typical power trucks. You know, we specialize in, in difficult and mountainous terrain projects. Every day that, that, that they're without power is a day that economy isn't functioning. It's another day people are suffering. David, Puerto Rico's governor said today they had little choice that Whitefish was the one company on the ground willing to do the work without payment up front. But he added the contract will be audited. David? Pierre Thomas tracking your money tonight, Pierre. Thank you. Two new congressional investigations involving former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Republican leaders in the House launching an inquiry into why the Obama administration allowed a Russian company to acquire U.S. uranium mines and whether Russian donations to the Clinton Foundation played any role in the decision. Former Secretary Clinton calling this, quote, baloney. And tonight, nearly a year after the election, Republicans with a separate inquiry as well into why the FBI decided not to charge Clinton for her use of a personal email server. 
There was still much more ahead on World News Tonight this Tuesday, remembering a well-known actor who made so many of us laugh. Also at this hour, we do have breaking news coming in involving the standoff with a fugitive police officer who cut off his GPS tracker. There are SWAT teams at the house, what we've learned. Those boulders thrown from an overpass, the windshield smashed, the father who was killed. And there is news tonight about the teenagers behind the deadly prank. And news of big changes this evening for the Mega Millions Lottery. What it means for your chances of winning now. A lot more news ahead. For the holidays, we get a gift from mom and dad. And every year we split it equally. Except for one of us. I write them a poem instead. And one for each of you, too. Oh. That's actually yours, that, that one. Yeah. Regardless, we're stuck with the bill. Well, to many, words are the most valuable currency. Well, last I checked, stores don't take words. Some do. Not everyone could be the poetic voice of a generation. I know, right? Such a burden. The Bank of America mobile banking app. The fast, secure, and simple way to send money. One, two, one, two, three, four. After a DVT blood clot, I sure had a lot on my mind. My 30-year marriage my three-month-old business. Plus, what if this happened again? I was given warfarin in the hospital, but wondered, was this the best treatment for me? So I made a point to talk to my doctor. He told me about Eliquis. Eliquis treats DVT and PE blood clots and reduces the risk of them happening again. Not only does Eliquis treat DVT and PE blood clots, Eliquis also had significantly less major bleeding than the standard treatment. Eliquis had both, and that turned around my thinking. Don't stop Eliquis unless your doctor tells you to. Eliquis can cause serious and in rare cases fatal bleeding. Don't take Eliquis if you have an artificial heart valve or abnormal bleeding. If you had a spinal injection while on Eliquis, call your doctor right away if you have tingling, numbness, or muscle weakness. While taking Eliquis, you may bruise more easily and it may take longer than usual for bleeding to stop. Seek immediate medical care for sudden signs of bleeding like unusual bruising. Eliquis may increase your bleeding risk if you take certain medicines. Tell your doctor about all planned medical or dental procedures. Eliquis treats DVT and PE blood clots, plus had less major bleeding. Both made Eliquis right for me. Ask your doctor if switching to Eliquis is right for you. We turn now to the deadly prank in Michigan. Five teenagers now charged with murder, allegedly dropping rocks from an overpass, killing a father on his way home. Authorities say the teens then went to McDonald's. Here's ABC's Adrian Bankert. Five teens led into court in shackles, facing the possibility of life in prison, accused of a cruel and deadly stunt. Deputies say the group of 15-year-olds and one 17-year-old threw more than a dozen rocks at cars from this Michigan overpass, one of them striking Kenneth White on his way home from work. Something came through the windshield. He's now unconscious. A six-pound rock hits White in the head and chest, killing him. Authorities say other cars were damaged and that afterwards the teens went to eat at McDonald's. White leaves behind four children, including a five-year-old son. And he keeps asking about his daddy. And the time he's not coming back. One of the teen's lawyers saying the penalties could vary. Although the charges are the same, the kids are all different. The actions that the kids may have uh, become involved in are all different. Family members heartbroken. Even if they spend 30 years in prison, they get to wake up every single morning. My son don't get none of that no more. That was taken away from him for something stupid. All five are being charged as adults, David. All have pled not guilty. They're being held without bond and due back in court November 2nd. David? Adrian Banker tonight. Adrian, thank you. When we come back, news coming in at this hour, the police standoff with a fugitive officer and the armed... 15-year-old Vincent Gonzalez from Chicago loves to play basketball. Everyone knows his moves. You can see him right there driving to the basket, playing for the local youth league. He often gets up at 5 in the morning to practice before heading to school. For so many months, Vincent could be found shooting hoops at the export gym with his friends. Trouble is, his family's membership to that private gym expired, and he could not afford to renew it. He was determined to keep playing basketball. It was kind of like a magic show. He would just randomly appear, not walking past the front desk. All of our entrances and exits are blocked, um, and sure enough, he would just show up on the basketball court. He was given several warnings and was told it's not okay to trespass. Enter Officer Mario Valenti. After 23 years in that job, you kind of size up people pretty quickly. He knew that Vincent just wanted to play ball. He offered $150 toward Vincent's gym membership himself. 
And inspired by that officer, the gym then waived hundreds in fees. That membership was extended for two years. For the officer to respond the way he did and turn what could have been a negative situation into an unbelievably positive situation, um, I thought that was really fantastic. And that player tonight, grateful to that officer. I think that was real nice. I said thank you. That, that meant a lot. America Strong. I'm David Muir. I hope to see you right back.